Welcome to the League's online conference, Global Stages, Local Stories. I'm Jesse Rosen, President and CEO of the League. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items to tend to. First, uh, thank you all working in orchestras, in and around orchestras, for all the incredible work you are doing now. We appreciate it. Thank you for being at our conference this afternoon, and those of you on the West Coast this morning, and all of you in between. Big thank you. And also to our exhibitors and sponsors, and please, if you have a chance, go see them on the online exhibit hall after the session. Um, during today's session, we're going to be taking questions uh, from the audience. And so if you have a question, the way to do that is to use the chat function in Feedloop or in Zoom, and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible. A recording and materials from today's conversation will be made available in Feedloop under session schedule tomorrow. And for those of you who are uh, participating in Feedloop, do not navigate away from the broadcast in your browser window, because if you do, you'll get kicked out of the session. But if that happens, don't worry, just come right back in and you'll be joining the meeting in progress. Um, also want to take a moment to welcome uh, a few members of the press who are with us in the audience, and we appreciate your participation as well. And also, um, at the end, it's important for us to understand how you are uh, experiencing our conference in this session in particular. So in the session description below, you can find a link to a brief survey where you can share scores and comments. And this feedback is really essential for us. It helps us know what we did and helps us shape our work going forward from here. So thank you in advance for taking a minute or two to complete that. I wanna again acknowledge that our colleagues of color and the many communities served by the orchestras that we represent are living with deep pain and fear and subjected to the threat of police violence and to ongoing oppression in our society, which is scarred by racism. And also that there's an urgent need for white people and predominantly, predominantly white organizations like ours to do the work of uprooting racism. And the work, of course, goes far beyond issuing statements and fleeting gestures. The League will continue to listen and to learn and to use its platforms to address racism. We are in this for the long haul. For right now, we are continuing the suspension of our fundraising campaign through the end of the week and again encourage you to support those Black-led organizations that are confronting racism locally and nationally. And also for right now, we're pleased to add this afternoon's session, Anti-Black Racism and American Orchestras. We'll begin in silence, sharing photographs of groundbreaking Black musicians, and then we'll hear from our League Board member, Dr. Aaron Flagg, who also is Chair and Associate Director of the Juilliard Jazz Studies Department. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aaron Flagg. I'm so grateful that you're here. We started with a photo slideshow honoring some of the orchestra musician pioneers of the mid 20th century. They, like today's black classical musicians, were resilient despite discrimination, structural inequities, and harassment. They honed their craft, as all musicians do, and were blessed to be able to make plain the music they love their life's work. We then saw a, a few collage photos of Black people who are, who are a sampling of their 21st century descendants, current players of our League member orchestras who bring benefit to our industry 
and follow in their ancestors' footsteps. The musicians' names and orchestra affiliations are listed at the end of this presentation. I can't not but think of the civil rights activist who had had enough over 50 years ago and stood up to protest by marching against the same injustice and violence we see today. I realize that their descendants of all races are out marching and peacefully protesting today. Your active participation is part of the same recognition that things need to be better. Thank you for being here. And thank Jesse and the league, uh, leadership for making this such a priority. During our time together, I encourage you to speak your truth, share your concerns, uh, your experience to help us all process the senseless killing of black people in our country, the current social unrest, while we all still battle a global pandemic, and the challenge of using this incredibly intense moment to not just survive, but to improve ourselves, our organizations, our communities, and by extension, our country. We are here to be in dialogue together in a safe, albeit virtual space. Uh, we seek to better understand the orchestra field's heritage and legacy and to examine how we can do better in eradicating systematic mistreatment or discrimination of black and brown peoples in classical music. The agenda for our time today will include defining some terms, looking at a key process in orchestra life, namely the audition process in, in the context of some historical facts. And then in the middle, we'll have some time for, to read and share some of your comments and your, and your questions. So I encourage you now to make notes of them and don't be shy. This is a family conversation. Please put them in the chat boxes so that we can share them and, and learn from your wisdom as well. Uh, we're all in this together. Uh, I'm not an expert, I'm just another human being out here. And so we really want to hear from you. Uh, after that session, we will also then engage the EDI committee of the League Board in sharing its work and its, the challenges it has, it has faced and some projects that are upcoming. And then we'll move to close with sharing eight ways of dismantling anti-Black racism in ourselves and our organizations as well. And with the remaining time we have, we certainly want to hear more comments and more questions. Although it's set up like a TV show, this is really ideally a conversation and a dialogue with all of us who care about this music so, so deeply. So again, I encourage you to make your notes and send in your questions. So with that as our agenda plan, we'll get started um, by going to look at some terms, just to have some common basis of understanding for our conversation. And one of them is, is racism. Uh, I would imagine for some people, even the title of this session, anti-Black racism. Uh, for some, it took a pause. Why anti-Black? Well, racism is not about just black and white. It's, it's uh, discrimination in, based on a belief system, no matter what the race is. So our session is focused on how racism impacts black people. But I wanna make sure we differentiate that racism is a belief. And something like white supremacy is a belief system uh, with many different tenets. Uh, I mentioned one there, one of the tenets being that white people have their own culture and that it is superior to other cultures. So if that's a belief system someone holds, it would seem to be, uh, to me anyway, logical to look at the fact, as Jesse mentioned, as a primarily white organization and, and art form, uh, that people would view our field as representing and defending that tenet of white supremacy, that our culture is the only one that's important, and that meaning that's the only music we're going to program, that's the only people who should engage in it. So uh, I know some in our field have recoiled at even those, those words and taken personal offense, but if we look at it as what it is, which is a belief system, um, then it is, I at least am able to not personalize it, but understand where people are coming from and their, their comments to us. And then another uh, word that is out there is bigotry. Uh, someone's a bigot, someone is a bigotry, bigot racist. All of these terms, I think it's important for us to understand that bigotry at its core is an intolerance. 
it's an unwillingness to move off your personal opinion or perspective and unwilling to even engage in understanding someone else's uh, perspective. So these, this page, if you will, these terms are really around uh, belief and other terms like prejudice, um, uh, really in stereotypes flow from your belief, but those move toward attitudes. And then if we can go to the next slide, that really is moving from belief to action, if, if I can simplify it that way, that when we say the word discrimination, we're talking about actions against people based on what we believe, what our assumptions are, what our attitudes are. So it's an individual act is an act of discrimination. But when you see a pattern of behavior, a pattern of policies that all seem to point in a similar direction, a long history of practices, um, then that starts to move to the realm of, of not an occasional error or misjudgment or uh, it, it is a pattern of treatment, a systematic discrimination against uh, racialized persons. And that is what our industry uh, is, as we all know, is, is being charged with. And it's important for us to look internal to our own personal beliefs, but our institution's beliefs, our own personal actions and, and how we treat others and our institution's actions and how it treats others. So we're gonna briefly look into one and critical element of orchestra life, as we all know, which is the audition process. And if we go to the next slide, we'll uh, look at some basic facts about hiring musicians, which is a key role that professional orchestras engage in, which is this audition system. I think as we look at that, it's important to note a, a, a fact that for over 100 years, uh, a black, I could not audition for a professional orchestra. I was not allowed to audition. And that was commonly known. My teachers would tell me that. Uh, the people who worked in the orchestras would tell me that. My community members would tell me that. Tell me that. Uh, I've spoken to you know, artists like the great bassist Ron Carter many times and read about Coleman Hawkins, the great jazz artist who himself was a cellist and was told very early on, there's no way he would ever make a living or be allowed to play the cello in life. So he switched to the tenor saxophone. And for those of us who've heard his great recording of Body and Soul, the world still receives some of his great musicianship, obviously. But someone like Ron Carter had that told to him and he moved also into the jazz area uh, because a door was made very clearly closed. That is not an individual treatment of uh, example of discrimination. That is a systemic example of discrimination. A industry has said you are not allowed to come in, not because of the dent of your talent, uh, but because of your skin. Um, but in, in addition, as you see, those who we saw in the slides earlier, someone like Donald White from the Cleveland Orchestra who was hired in 1957, he tells the story that the only reason he got heard and by the way, he was studying at, uh, I used to be the dean and professor at the Hart School at the University of Hartford. And in part of that role, I read about him and his work as a student at the University of Hartford. And at the same time, he was playing assistant principal cello in the Hartford Symphony, which at that time, they were con there was a connection between the two. So his wife, the story goes, uh, Dolores, noted, noted that Donald was taking and intermittent lessons with Leonard Rose, the great cellist. And Leonard Rose thought very highly of Donald. And Dolores said, hey, when you call Leonard the next time, ask him to recommend any major orchestra positions in the country. And Donald says he was very shy to do so. So she stood behind him during his next phone call with Leonard Rose and made sure he asked, hey, do you know about any major orchestra positions that might be open? And only because he asked Leonard Rose, said, yes, I am aware of one in Cleveland and called George Zell directly and found out about it. George Zell arranged an, an audition in his New York apartment, apparently within the next, within a couple of weeks, and he was awarded that position. So it takes the advocacy of individual people, and in this case, some incredibly high profile individuals in our, our art form to create that access even at that time. So um, another element that we all may not be aware of is that to be a member of an orchestra, obviously you need to be a member of the union. 
Well, here is another example of systemic discrimination in that when orchestras were being founded in the late middle and late 19th century, unions themselves, they were restricted to only white people. And so even if you were able to audition for an orchestra, you couldn't join because you couldn't be in the union. And even when uh, around the turn of the century, 1901 actually, the first black union started to be sanctioned um, by the then uh, National League of Musicians, uh, they were segregated. So oftentimes those unions weren't made aware of openings that became in orchestras. Um, and so their job opportunities were differentiated and segregated. And as many of us know, later in the 20th century, 1941 to 74, uh, these segregated unions uh, proliferated and really were symbols of unequal access to not only auditions, playing opportunities, representation in the national union. Uh, in fact, I was speaking with one gentleman who was a part of the Los Angeles merger. That's where I'm from. And I said, well, that must have been a great thing. And he said, actually, no, there was a lot of resistance from black musicians to, to integrate the unions. And I said, well, why would that be the case? He said, because we were officers in the national union because we led our locals. And so once we merged, all the white people took all those spaces. So the representation for black musicians we knew would go away. And so that was something we had to be prepared to give up in order to be uh, together. Um, and that type of sacrifice is not known. And as, as a side note, uh, there, is, there were um, places of business, not just orchestras, other places where musicians worked that were equally segregated. Only white musicians could work at this place, only black musicians at that place. Though that creates an unequal uh, networking unit. You can't share information, advice, get to know people, get the support that Leonard Rhodes gave Donald White, uh, and, unless you have those opportunities to be together. So in looking at the audition system and these types of systemic uh, examples of the systemic uh, discrimination, um, one other aspect I'd like to point out from the next slide is how our society did notice this throughout the 20th century. And here are just three examples how people outside of the field, outside of our industry, said, wait a minute, this is a problem. And one of them is the job status of Negro professional musicians report from the Urban League in 1958 that was published. There were articles written um, and having read the board minutes of the New York Philharmonic during that time and before, it, it clearly uh, catalyzed a lot of conversation because those reports noted that since 1842 up to 1958, over 100 years, not one black orchestral musician had ever been hired for anything in the New York Philharmonic or in the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. That uh, brought pressure, as you can imagine, and embarrassment, public embarrassment to the orchestra. And, but fortunately, by December 1958, uh, Elaine Jones, who you saw pictured in the early slide, a wonderful timpanist, uh, who later played in the San Francisco Symphony and the San Francisco Opera, she was hired to uh, play extra on a piece in 1958, and the manager of the Philharmonic proudly noted, we now have had our first African-American play in the orchestra. Um, but the fact that it took a report to help catalyze that, or, or at least speed the process up, is an interesting thing to note. The other one in 1969 with the New York Philharmonic, not to pick on my hometown band, uh, was the, uh, the Commission on Human Rights. And, and although they were uh, proved as not guilty, or ruled as not guilty in terms of permanent positions, as you see there, it was noted that in this engagement in a pattern of practice of discrimination in terms of substitutes and extras and the understanding that the players engage their own students and not try to make that substitute and apprentice opportunities open to all. And then just as a final example, the fact that Michigan state legislatures, the legislators, two of them, threatened boycotts and withheld $1.3 million from the Detroit Symphony Orchestra in 1989 until they hired a second musician, who by the way happened to be on tour with them when the report came out, and so they quickly uh, engaged him. 
Um, so the fact that our industry has had to, in some instances, rely on outside people, outside our field to help us do the right thing is an indictment on our, our attitude and is an indication that uh, the ideas of racism uh, cannot be said to not exist in our field uh, in, in what has been called the, the subtle way. As uh, Malcolm X once said, he preferred his Southern racist because he knew exactly where they stood. Whereas the Northern racist, they were sly and they wouldn't come out and tell you directly. And so I think in all of us, uh, those types of beliefs and attitudes take internal and personal self-examination. Um, at this point, as I mentioned, I wanted to, to pause, invite some of my EDI committee to join me if they like, and I'm going to try my best to capture and go back to some of the questions that have been brought up and to see if we can together, can together answer them. Uh, David has been kind to shoot me some questions. Um, let me see if I can get to them. So two, two questions. Um, one was, what if, and I would open up for my colleagues to jump into this if they'd like. What advice can you give to administrations of predominantly or all white orchestras as they seek to attract black musicians to become members? That's one question to consider. And do you have any thoughts or ideas about creating more diverse boards in uh, race, class, age, and abilities within organizations that have had all white or predominantly white boards since its inception. I'm gonna ask, actually ask our board chair, Doug Hangerman, to, to jump in on the second question first, if he doesn't mind, uh, given his, uh, I would say, quite successful leadership in that very area. Doug? Thanks, Aaron. Um, <clears throat> the, the process of ensuring that you have uh, a more diverse board in, in my um, judgment, in my experience, is first and foremost a matter of determination. Um, it's a matter of creativity and outreach. If you, if you devote your energy to it and you go looking for people, instead of relying on your typical network and the people who you already know, uh, I think you'll find people who are able to serve on your board and who are able to contribute their perspective. Um, uh, at, at, the, at the league, um, all it really took was a push from uh, Jesse and me with the support of the rest of the board, and we were able to uh, rapidly increase the number of people of color on the board. Um, in an individual community that could be, can be, um, slightly more difficult. And uh, so uh, what you need to do is work hard at it, seek people out, uh, go beyond your existing network and find people. Um, we, we certainly don't wanna go down the rat hole of uh, uh, board member philanthropy, but uh, in my opinion, um, while there are plenty of people of color <clears throat> who can meet predefined board minimums, if you allow those board minimums to be an obstacle to bringing people in, then you're probably gonna to struggle to get to where you wanna end up. And it's important to have policies that are flexible enough that you can um, have diversity on your board by uh, relaxing that hurdle or, or, or meeting it in some other way. Or it's, uh, because obviously people contribute to a board more than their money. And, you want their perspective, you want their participation, you want their, their words and their ideas. And so um, I, I guess I, my, in my view, it's hard work and going beyond your existing network and then being flexible about those monetary policies. Right. I would also add to that, if I may, Doug, um, that in your recruitment of, of the board members, uh, to not forget that people want to feel wanted for themselves, not just for their skin color. So what talents, what knowledge, what, what special abilities that are going to strategically contribute to your organization uh, drive your interest in that person? 
having been approached many times by many organizations, I'm very direct and say, uh, how excited are you for, for me to help your diversity percentage versus excited for me to help your organization in some specific way? And to the extent you can answer that, uh, that will increase the excitement of individuals to want to be engaged in your organization. Daniel? Uh, Daniel Romain, head of the DBR, have a question. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much, uh, Jesse and uh, Doug and my fellow uh, board members, my brothers and my sisters here. Thank you so much, Aaron, for, uh, I don't wanna to talk too long. This is a shared conversation. We have, um, what I love is we have two audiences, one, well, actually three audiences where we all are held in captivity in our spaces, in our homes. That's a certain privilege, right? The privilege of, of shelter. And we have an online chat happening, which is lighting up which is important. I'm trying to be responsive there. And uh, I would encourage my board members to be responsive there. Let's make sure we save that chat. And of course we have um, online participants now, well over 500, which is really, really important. And I've been doing a lot of these um, convenings and this is, a, this is a larger one and it's in real time. And um, I like to say there are 522 plus people who are breathing and alive. And during this conversation, there will be hundreds and thousands of people who are gonna be losing their lives lest we forget. We also have, as I can see, musicians who are out in the street risking, risking their lives. Anna, violinist with the Virginia Symphony. Quote, I've been protesting in Richmond, Virginia for several days. She's in an all white orchestra, unquote, um, playing, almost, playing only music by black composers during Black History Month for predominantly black schools. How can we explain to orchestras that this is almost more important to perform for white children, so on and so forth. So there's lots of questions in there, and um, I'm just saying that I hear you, I acknowledge you, that 522 souls living and breathing is important. So I thank uh, the League for bringing us together. It's important that we convene. To the question of boards, um, I did respond. What advice can you give to administrators? Um, and part of what I said was um, diversifying a board centers on representation by invitation and inclusion. What are the guiding principles for your orchestration, orchestra, organization, and audience? Are they all aligned? Does your current board reflect and speak directly to your values? Can your future board help you better define who you are? Invitation is the key. And I would look to the people in your community who are leading during this time of pandemic, conflict, crisis, and change. Look to the leaders speaking to truth, reconciliation, and rehabilitation. You know, and connected to this, I think there was a question about uh, how can you manage a board that isn't particularly diverse or a hostile, let's call it a hostile board member. All of these questions are about, um, I would say, center it on your home. If you have friends, family, children, ask them, who would they want to see on your board, right? If someone were in your home and they were hostile and they were saying things openly that you didn't agree with, that were wrong, what would you do? Would you ask them to leave your home, right? Those are the behaviors I think you should bring to the board. See the board as a place, as your not conference table, but dinner table, right? Anything, let's, let's make this a contract about specific systemic change based on morality and decency. And let's, here's, here's a way for, and this isn't, I'm gonna switch now very quickly to artist mode. As a composer, it's very easy for me to look to Zachary as my child and sit at a table with him Anyone sitting at that table with me, anything that they say or they do, I want it to be what is best for my child. That makes it easy. When you're at your next board meeting, if anybody says or does anything that you wouldn't want them to say in front of your child or mine, then they shouldn't be at the table. Let that be our guiding principle for what we do. I yield, thank you. PBR, thank you so much. Uh, Alan Mason I, I had his hand up and then I saw Hugh. So Alan, did you <clears throat> Thanks, Aaron. Uh, on this question of recruiting a more inclusive board, um, I think I, I, I've been a change agent for LGBT inclusion and other inclusion, both in the corporate and in the arts world. 
And the thing that I see when you want people, when you want to create change, the organization has to act like an ally. It has to have people have to come out as an ally of the cause that they want to embrace. And so I think like the statement that was published this week by the league and the, that this session itself, those kinds of public acts, you have to be willing to risk the controversy uh, that could come up either in your family or your friends or in uh, uh, an organization or a community. But that's the kind of thing that makes the people who are themselves diverse and joining an organization feel like you are committed to this work and that you're going to have the courage to stand with this community. And I just think that, that that's, that's a real ally sort of mindset. And we need allies for all kinds of social change. I wonder, uh, Hugh wanted to speak and then I want to make sure we don't lose track of that question about engaging um, Black musicians in one's orchestra. And it's good that we're talking about board, but we want to address on the on the stage question as well. But Hugh? I just wanted to uh, comment uh, that of the two prongs of that question, uh, uh, question number two uh, is the relatively easy one. Um, um, my experience uh, directly with a uh, full-time professional orchestra is here in New Orleans. Um, a medium-sized city with a, uh, a black majority population. Um, and if one goes way back to the old orchestra, clearly an all-white uh, establishment uh, on the stage, in the audience, on the board, in the boardroom. Uh, five or six years ago, we started our own uh, equity, diversi diversity, and inclusion committee of the board. Uh, we had always, in my experience the last 20 years, had one or two black members of the board. Uh, we reached out, built a lot of relationships, um, and now have an African American who is the president of our board. And just as the old adage is that uh, in development, people give to people. Um, Diversifying the board, particularly racially, I think, uh, in our case, has been very important for, again, people asking people. And our current board chair has uh, done yeoman work in broadening uh, the scope of our board. Uh, not surprisingly, in New Orleans, we've always had gender diversity. We've had LGBT diversity, both in the orchestra and the boardroom and the staff. Um, but now, for the first time, I can say we really have a board that is approaching uh, representation of the full community. We already had a staff uh, in that situation. Uh, our big challenge remains uh, the first part of the question, uh, which is getting that diversity uh, into the performing organization, whether they're performing in the traditional concert hall or out in the schools or wherever. Great. Thank you so much, Hugh. And to the question about players on the stage, I'm open to any, anyone uh, jumping in, but I would just mention to those orchestras who are saying, well, gee, uh, someone had mentioned they're in a freelance environment. How do I uh, secure that support and uh, finding um, black musicians to be in my orchestra? Um, so that we're here, <laughs> we're here. If you don't know, call touch base with anybody, any of us, we, we're a network. We'll, we'll find that person and people for you. Um, and the issue is, I know it may feel, I'm not trying to the, disparage at all the feeling of, I, I don't know where to find people. Uh, so well, that's, that's somewhat easy. What's a little harder is making sure that your request to them is based on their ability to play, which is what we've spent our career developing. Uh, not just, and again, for my experience is what I know. I, you know, years ago, finishing up at Juilliard and playing, I got calls to say, oh, we, uh, we want you to come and play. And I, of course, said, oh, that's great. Where did you hear from me? Oh, someone said, uh, gave us a list of black trumpet players. So we just thought we'd give a call. Now, I'm insulted because you haven't heard me play. That's what I've been working on. And to tell me that's the only reason you're calling because of a list um, is, is uh, maybe expeditious for you, but it's insulting to me. It, it, you know, you come to my recital, come to this concert, you heard this and you really want to engage me because of, 
of the plane. So and as you're making your efforts, building your network of people to help you find classical artists of color to engage, make sure you go that extra mile, check out their YouTube clip, listen to them playing, uh, you know, show respect for their artistry, not just need for their color. That I think would be really helpful. Alan Peterson, looks like you have your hand up, sir. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, and hey, everybody, this is really a fantastic conversation. Um, I, I wanted to go back and address the question that Anna from the Virginia Symphony asked a while ago about, um, you know, being in an all white orchestra and uh, black music being limited to Black History Month and asking like how to explain to the orchestra that it's actually really important to play music by black artists for white children. Um, and, you know, there's lots of research that I've seen about the impact of uh, diverse images from diverse people on children. Um, it's mostly about films and TV. Um, but I think it applies very much to, uh, to what we do as well. Um, and it's about how, um, how the images that, you know, the, the, the people that, that children see at these very impressionable years uh, impacts their empathy, impacts the assumptions they make when they encounter people in the world. Um, and I, I think there's such a strong case to be made that it's very important to play music by diverse composers and particularly by black artists for, um, for children group, groups of children, um, and you know, white children as well as, um, you know, as well as more diverse children. Um, and uh, you know, what you asked your, your point about um, black composers only be playing during Black History Month. Um, that really strikes me and it's something that we talked a lot about um, when I was in my, in my Brooklyn Phil years. And I was really pleased there to be able to develop an understanding organization that it was really important that, that Black artists weren't just put in side programs that had, um, that were branded as being about racial identity. Um, and that, that having work by Black artists through our programs more generally um, uh, made a much more powerful statement about the importance of the work and the importance of the artists um, in our community. So I think that's also a point that uh, maybe you can talk about and maybe there are other people in your orchestra who would be game to talk about too. There's uh, some other questions and please colleagues on the, on the panel jump in if you want to uh, change direction here. But there was a question about grant dollars and the use of DEI programs and efforts to, uh, I'm gonna make sure I respect the way this was worded, um, the, about the efforts to use communities of color in an effort to pull down DEI grant dollars. How do we push for authentic inclusion and not the quote, I'll do this to get a grant mindset? Uh, that's really great. I have some positive news for whomever wrote that, that the foundations and the organizations that are giving those grant dollars are getting generally better and better at uh, having accountability for long-term impact and desire. Um, I will just say I'm associated with one right now where orchestras are, are communicating due to, of course, the situation, a desire to divert the uh, DEI grant money they've been received uh, to other uh, critical areas of need. So instead of investing in supporting their organization to become more inclusive, they wanna use the money to fund some other aspects of their area. And the opportunity that this funder has is to say, no, this, you applied with this as a critical need. You need to demonstrate commitment to that and be creative, figure out some other ways. And I, and I say that not without any understanding. I have direct understanding of being in, in an organization and being told we have no money for payroll this week. And my job as the executive director there was to solve that. So we solved it. So I know what that pain and stress feels like, but funders will hold us to account. I think whoever with that question, you and your colleagues within that organization are, are the leaders. You need to stand up and say, hey, what is, what's the right thing to do here? Are we really committed to this organization? Are we just getting a signature from them so we can get that money and not commit to that work? So um, I joined the, the person who asked the question in that concern. And um, I think speaking out is one way to address that. I don't know if others have any response to that. Okay, and another question was, how do we walk the line as an organization that has struggled with a lack of diverse members 
hoping to engage black artists without having the issue that Aaron encountered though. How can you be intentional without being insulting, without having it be perceived as for maybe actually filling a quota? Anyone want to jump in on that? Since it said me, I can answer later. Uh, DV here. Yeah, I think I think the I think we have had a um, an incredible. I want to just acknowledge, actually, first of all, um, and I'm, I'm mindful of this is a shared space and time, but I do want to take a few seconds and say we have all been through and continue to go through trauma. So the trauma of the last now 11 days is visceral. It's real. I call that immediate trauma, but there's historical trauma, and you know when we get into this to respond to the uh, question uh, more directly um, from Emily. Emily, thank you for your question. Um, you know, trauma, if you think of a wound, there's initial steps in the healing process. So there's the immediate step, there's the intermediate, uh, the, or the uh, intermediary step, the middle step, and then the resolution, right? The suturing or the closing or the, the, the healing process is complete. So however you want to look at this in terms of our trauma, I would say um, we we probably feel like, I feel like I've taken a blow, right? I feel abused, abused. I feel bruised, right? Emotionally, I, I am eviscerated. I'm, I'm, I'm exhausted by it all. So as you think about the immediate steps that we have to take towards healing and the healing process. This is one of them that's convening. Another one is just talking about systemic, specific systemic changes. Then you don't have to worry about quotas or anything. You're talking about those initial steps. And those initial steps are the hardest steps. You know, when I was growing up, if you got a cut, my father loved to pour iodine on it. Remember that? <laughs> this was, you know, this was an important part of his process. And you saw it coming and you knew the bottle. He would hold you, he was a big man, he'd hold you down. But there was almost this, um, not joy, but there was a contract that we had that in order to get to something better, you had to go through something that was shocking even, right? I'm 50 years old, you can get it. I don't know if they still use iodine. But um, the point I'm trying to get to is that quotas may feel painful. These initial steps are going to feel painful, and they should, right? Because you're going on and into a healing process. And, you know, all of this, I'm seeing a lot of questions about blind auditions, the board. I want to leave you with just this, these thoughts. In my humble opinion, we're past aspirational postings. We've all done it. We have done it. And it's great. It was important to do it. Now we're on to action. So I'll leave you with this, three important things. Specific systemic change. Over the next week to 10 days, get together in your group and talk about it all. Quotas, you don't need us to do that. What are the specific systemic changes you can then, number two, publicly announce? a public statement that supports your specific systemic change. And number three, the date. What is, when is the date that these specific systemic changes are going to happen? If you can do those three things and they are painful, you will get you and your organization in a month can be in a radically different place than you are now. I call that equity. I also wanna quickly thank Bob uh, Wagner so much for his visionary work years ago towards the things that we're talking about today. Thank you, Thank you DBR. And we're going to get right to, um, and we'll come back to some more questions and comments in, uh, near the end of the session, but uh, and I'm going to hear from Pratichi and then turn to this, this committee that everyone's looking at and some others who weren't able to join and, and their work, back to DBR's point, what actions can you put a date to uh, for the league? But first, Pratichi, you had uh, some comments? Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Aaron, for, for leading this conversation and Jesse and the staff for hosting it. Um, and Daniel, for all your wise, brilliant comments. It's so hard to follow you, um, but I'm gonna try. Uh, so one of the questions that came in uh, was around staff and how do we kind of uh, get staff ready to deal with this? And how do we, um, do we train staff? Do we have a 
Do we have a staff training on implicit bias or some of these kinds of things? And I think what we're circling to is we're recognizing all the various parts, right, of the orchestra. We've talked a little about boards. We'll, we've talked just a little bit about musicians and we'll talk more about them and then the piece about staff. And as Daniel said, once you've made the commitments, once you're taking the action, the actions ultimately have to be taken throughout your orchestra. So looking at the board, diversifying the board, and getting staff ready and making sure that trainings and education are part of that, but it's not the only part. It's also making sure that there is a communication flow through so that people understand that the entire orchestra has embraced this. This isn't about any of these things that we've talked about. about. As, as Daniel said, quotas, might you might have to start there and it's painful, but it's not about that. It's not about the grants. It is about shifting not just not just the orchestra, but the mindset that exists in every aspect of the orchestra. And education is part of that because as we diversify, we have to know how to communicate with each other, how to talk with each other about things that are not going to be comfortable. So having the skill sets to talk with each other about those uncomfortable topics, about the events of the last 11 days and how people are affected because they will be affected differently, having those conversations it's critical that we train not just the staff, but the musicians and the board to have those conversations, not just in their individual groups, but all throughout the orchestra together so that we all shift, we all move forward together. Great, that's beautiful. Thank you so much for teaching. And, and uh, as an example of what that work feels like in real time, um, my colleagues and I have been engaged uh, in this committee of the Equity, Diversity, Inclusion Committee of the Board for several years. But as uh, DBR mentioned, Bob Wagner, although he may have a Wagner relation, I may not be aware of, but Bob Wagner, who's a principal of the of New Jersey Symphony, has really led the charge and would love to turn it over to him to help us understand how did this start uh, and, and share that experience with our colleagues. Sure. Um, thanks, Aaron. Um, for as long as I can remember, uh, as I was serving on the League's Governance Committee, we articulated the goal of increasing the number of persons of color on the League board, but year after year, we made very little progress on that. And about nine years ago, Aaron Dworkin, who was then president's, president of the Sphinx organization, had agreed to join the board, but only if the League would agree to form a diversity and inclusion task force. Um, so Aaron joined the board and I was asked to chair the new DEI or D, D and I task force. Um, that task force had a charter um, that was to recommend to the board and staff a general scope and focus of league activity that helps orchestras advance their work uh, in the area of diversity and to identify those activities which the league is uniquely qualified to carry out. Um, so we always considered our work to be kind of two-pronged, one focusing on the league itself, and that, and that means our board and our staff, but also looking as to how we could help the field. As we began, we looked back at what the league had done and written uh, related to DNI. We were surprised at the large number, number of articles in Symphony Magazine. Um, especially, I was thrilled to read the section of Americanizing the American Orchestra that came out and its whole section on diversity, which seems so prescient even to this day. Um, these were written with passion and with imperative and it seemed kind of incongruous that we were now only restarting to think about this work. The one thing we did discover was lacking was the continuing commitment to this work and as a group talked about the sustainability of it as a key focus of our discussion. Um, so this was uh, aided by a grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation back in 2012. We were able to launch our first iteration of some online resources for our members. And internally then, we focused on helping the entire board understand some of the complexities of DEI in the orchestra field. We were really fortunate to have the support of engaged board leadership and of course Jesse Rosen's stalwart leadership both in voice and in print in support, in support of diversity, equity, and inclusion. When the board rethought its committee structure, um, those focused on the league's programmatic activities were reduced to an ad hoc status and the D&I task force 
was the exception, and it became one of the board's standing committees. So we undertook next to develop a strategic, a strategic plan for EDI. Equity had gotten promote, promoted to top building in the new plan. We were once again afforded the chance for a more valuable board time to continue the discussion with the board and the plan was adopted. And as Doug mentioned earlier, one of the things that was called for in that plan was that we uh, establish a minimum of 25% membership of uh, the board being of people of color. I'm so glad as of last month that we've actually exceeded that number. Um, it's really important, as we stated in the strategic plan, that we always approach this work with curiosity and with humility. There are no easy answers to the tough challenges that EDI poses to us but we view this as a journey and we're taking it together. Um, as we look for the change that we're seeking, I'm really grateful for Aaron Dworkin, Dworkin for insisting and for Jesse Rosen and his staff for assisting and now for Aaron Flagg for persisting to push us forward to a more equitable, equitable diverse, inclusive league and orchestra field. Thanks, Aaron. Beautiful job, Bob. I didn't know you had those lyrical skills. That's great. I'm a musician. What can I say? <laughs> Wanted to open up to other members of the committee to, to really look at and share with those of us on the call, or our colleagues, what have you been learning? Or basically, what have we been learning as we are trying to deal with this work? Um, I can talk about the benefits of the committee being there, but we'll get to those. I think more important and more helpful is what has been your journey in doing this work here? Alan Valentine? I'd like to um, thank, thank you, Aaron. And, and um, I have to say that I, I think this is a really great discussion. There have been a lot of really great questions asked and some really terrific answers. I want to you know, sort of build on uh, what Patrici was saying about uh, the, the notion of training, first of all, I, what I have found in our institution is that training has done a great deal to align people within our institution with a common understanding, a common vocabulary, and, and sort of tools to talk about all of this. And what, what, what I think has been critical in our case is the question of listening. And I think one of the things that um, we all need to do more of is listening, and I and I can say that within our institution, you know, it's it's going in asking people of color to tell us about their experience because you know we don't experience the same things, you know, and and as we've built, uh, uh, you know, the the diversity of our board, for example, um, what we found is that it, as we really began to investigate. Um, how to go about that work. It wasn't just about building relationships with people we didn't know. It turned out that there were lots of people within our own audience. And so now, you know, we have a chair elect who, who is black and um, not, not be, she's not chair elect because she's black. She's chair elect because she's the right person to be the chair elect. And it's been a fantastic evolution, but it started with listening and really, you know, the, the questions that I remember she asked us early on, and we're not unlike what you mentioned earlier, Aaron, there were questions like, well, why me? Why, you know, the first thing was, you know, um, as she came onto the board, we asked her for an increased gift. She made the gift. And then we said, uh, without blinking. And then she said, um, uh, the next year we said, we'd like for you to chair the annual fund. And she said, well, why me? And we said, well, because you lead by example. You just, you, you responded so grace, grace, graciously to our request. And then the subsequent year, she chaired the annual fund, knocked it out of the park. And then again, we said, we'd like you to think about being the chair elect. And she said, why me? And again, you know, we said, well, you know, here, you did this, you did this, you did this. And, you know, it's clear you're passionate about the cause. And and I, I will say that, you know, a lot of, um, you know, what we learned about both that and how to deal with the question of how can we attract more people of color to our orchestras as musicians starts with listening. And so, you know, e even as we've had some, some modest success in Nashville in, in improving that situation with the orchestra, we, we really started by asking questions and saying, tell us, help us understand how to go about this work. 
and it's been really uh, quite a journey. Um, we're still not completely there. I mean, we're at the very beginning of a very long journey. Uh, we, we clearly acknowledge that. We know we have a lot to learn, but, it, but it's really been um, fascinating to me that the training has produced alignment and we have more of that yet to do. And the listening has produced really a, a much better understanding of the concrete actions we can take. And you have to be intentional about how you go about this work. You know, I think Dan, Daniel, you said, you know, very clearly that, um, uh, you know, you, you have to take action. The action really means a lot more than all the words. And so that, that's what I would say. It's a, the listening thing though. It's, that's really helpful. Thank you. I wonder, Gloria or Mary, if, you, if either of you would like to share your experience in this work, uh, either from your work on, on the league board in terms of, uh, or other affiliations and other organizations you're working with. We'd just love to hear from you. I'm sure people would appreciate it. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm in the Philadelphia Orchestra. I'm a cellist. And I'm also on the league board and I've been really privileged to be part of this work and have my own personal growth, I think actually influence my work in my own orchestra. And I would like to thank the league for that opportunity to have that growth and to be able to bring that learning to my orchestra and also the league enables my orchestra to do this work as an as an organization from a grant from the Catalyst Fund. So I think that's an, an additional um, resource for all of the orchestras out there is to help to get some funding. We had other funders that matched the grant, which enabled us to hire a really amazing um, group of people, professionals to help guide us in our work and help to not inform our decisions, but to help us reach our own conclusions. And it was great because this process, which we've just gone through fortuitously, um, really had us evaluating our present state and it had all stakeholders involved in the in the process. Let's just put that out there from the beginning. So it wasn't a top down thing. It was like a full organizational representation. So we were able to assess our current state. We were able to define our values. We we're able to, to articulate what our actions are going to be over horizons. And um, I think you're going to see some statements that I can't I mean, some actual uh, results from the actions, which I can't make public right at the moment, but you'll see within the next few days um, from the Philadelphia Orchestra from having had this opportunity. And I really felt like I was able to be um, a really um, listened to partner in my orchestra because of my experience on the league board of this of this EDI committee and um, this EDI committee has really with Bob's work initially and Aaron's leadership and Daniel's really thoughtfulness and Anthony's um, just amazing inspiration at all the time everybody's voice everybody's voice on this committee has been heard and it's been so um enriching and and so informative to to our journey so i just would like to thank everybody for that thank you gloria uh, mary would you like to add something oh you're muted you're still muted oh no there you are. This is the committee that first taught me to use Zoom. So I'm embarrassed, Bob Wagner, that I missed my cue. Um, I just wanna say the two words that have come up in the conversation just now, patience and humility. Those to me, you have over, we have over 500 people listening in right now who are concerned enough to take in this crazy time we're living in, to take an hour and a half of their afternoon because they really care. So. I say to all of you, care enough and continue to care and understand that it's your individual responsibility. And it takes a lot of patience to do this work. It really does. And that for me is the biggest challenge is, is understanding that you don't just come through the door of your orchestra, of any place that you go, anything you're involved in. I mean, people know individually the difference between what's right and what's wrong, and they know what equality really is. And so what the league has done by Bob Wagner's leadership originally, and you've heard everyone else who's come together on this, has really caused me personally to think about 
this whole issue and to talk about it with other people and to quote the league and you have the resources of the league to start out with if you want of your orchestra i mean if there's ever a time when this country this world would love to have some good leadership it's now and i think that the orchestras in this country have the opportunity right now at this challenge to be the ones to lead please do it that's great that's great uh, I, I will want to um, wrap up this. Oh, Doug, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I just, I just want to say uh, a little bit, Aaron, about what's next for um, the league conversation around EDI. And I'll ask my um, colleagues to, to chime in if I miss an important element. Um, the league board has been talking for uh, a while, a year or so, about the need for essentially truth and reconciliation in our field and the need for us to help people to understand that there is a, a past of exclusion, there is a, a past of discrimination, um, there is a past of inequity, and it persists into the present in ways that sometimes are easy to see and sometimes aren't so easy to see. And um, the, uh, the, the, the full um, consideration of that past and that present runs uh, smack into how we view meritocracy in our field, how we view excellence, artistic and otherwise, in our field, and uh, w exactly how we select uh, musicians, exactly how we build staffs and board, and exactly how we program seasons, frankly, um, uh, and so that those uh, so that those values of equity, diversity, and inclusion can um, really come alive in orchestras. So we're planning it over the course of the coming months to engage with the field in a conversation about this, about what is that past and what are its vestiges in the present and how does it hold people back and what does it have to do with um, the representation we currently see in our field uh, how is it reflected in the traditions of our field that we're going to have to change and so forth. So there's upcoming educational and convening opportunities for the field where we're going to try and spur conversation around this um, as a prelude to essentially uh, acknowledging our role as individual orchestras and as the league in this, in this uh, discriminatory past, in this ex exclusionary past. And um, so think of it as the coming apology that we're in the process of uh, convening a conversation around so that we can acknowledge these things and confront them as, as human beings. And so there's a whole lot of uh, work that we as your league have planned to engage in with you. Some of it will be learning opportunities and some of it will be convening. And we understand that we're not perfect and that we need to first and foremost mirror the values that we're talking about before we can be a credible voice on them. So we're working very hard on ourselves as well. But this is all work that's coming up and I would encourage all of you to get engaged in and to lean into. Thank you so much, Doug, that's great. Uh, Jesse, did you wanna add something to that and then I'll need to move on. Yeah, uh, Doug, thank you for that. And, um, and thanks too to all of our, our committee members. It's of course gratifying to hear all of your comments. And I just want to un underscore that we're, we're not uh, speaking to all of you who are listening from the standpoint that we have figured this out and uh, far, far from it. And I wanted to just uh, cite at least two really important pieces of work that we still have to do as a staff and as a board. The first one does really have to do with racism. And uh, if, in case anyone hasn't noticed, the league's view about equity, diversity, and inclusion has not centered race as distinct or different or holding a different position from among many different types of people of difference who are marginalized in our society. And the events in, the, in recent weeks, I know for myself personally, has changed my own beliefs about this and about the, the, the centrality of racism as a force in our society that is in fact different. It doesn't eliminate all those other issues, but it is truly, truly central. And that, that's a kind of different conversation, a different kind of work 
And uh, we, we have to come to grips with that at the league as a staff and as a board. And this is, this, is, this is new work for us. And the second thing I would say is the question of equity remains an enormous challenge across our entire field. And like what people say about fish and water that you know, they, they don't know that, that they can't breathe and they don't know they're in water, it's all they know. We, we tend not to know how much power we hold. We tend to regard ourselves as dealing in an environment of scarcity compared to much, maybe most of the arts community, we, we are wealth personified and we take up lots of space and lots of room and lots of resource. And we haven't yet figured out how to be good partners to the rest of the arts community and to the rest of our communities, period, with respect to resources. And this is another piece of really hard work ahead. And I just wanted to put those out there just in, in case anyone thought we got it all figured out. So far from it, uh, we, we have a, a lot to do ahead and we look forward to doing it, look forward to doing it with, with, with our board and, and with all of you who are listening. Uh, Aaron, back over to you. Thank you so much, Jesse, for that. It's very important clarification. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't fixed everything yet. We're not perfect. But at the same time, uh, as, as Doug had mentioned, in the coming months, be it uh, some work with the full board we'll, we'll be approving shortly. Uh, there will be a big article in Symphony Magazine with a bit more of the history and some facts that will hopefully empower uh, folks to really, uh, I've saw several asking who are artist managers and others in different roles in the field, how can I get engaged and clearly getting information and, and being empowered to speak up and finding your voice of how to do that will be really helpful. And also to those who've been asking, what do we do with um, very reticent board members or other members of our, our orchestra's establishments who are maybe not as open to these, these conversations even. Um, and so arming yourself with that information will be helpful and that's coming out. One thing I also wanna try to quickly touch on, forgive my speed, but is uh, education. People are saying, as is a typical thought process, well, we get our musicians from the schools, so we need to, how do we get the schools to diversify and importantly, uh, primary, secondary education to address some of these. Uh, those, that sentiment to me is a perfect place to uh, be a, become an ally and become a, a catalyst to those areas. Uh, if you're in a, an orchestra in a major city with a major school, you should be on the phone to the head of that school. Uh, the chair there, the dean there, saying, what are, your goal, what are your diversity goals? How are you all working to address that? Because you're going to be feeding into our orchestra. So we have a vested interest to understanding how those students are being prepared and how can we partner with you? How can, what assets can we share to, to really work together on this? So um, as an example, at Juilliard, uh, there is major change. Uh, well before the, this recent uh, situations, uh, around uh, equity work. Um, and the new president immediately hired a director of uh, this work, EDIB work, and faculty have been meeting. And within a year, everyone has required training in this. And uh, they built an online source for it. We're looking at admissions across the school in a very different way. Uh, so sometimes it's with leadership. Sometimes as we're seeing out on the streets in the evening tonight, it's uh, from, from quote unquote, the bottom up of people demanding that there be change. So whatever role you have in this field, you can make a difference and we need you to. And that includes people holding the league accountable, not just holding the schools accountable. So, and we welcome that. And the last thing I'll say as it relates to this committee, um, I can only testify as someone who's been on the board uh, over 20 years. And when Bob took over the, uh, started the task force, to be honest, I had no interest in participating because I viewed it as a potential tokenism to have a black guy on the diversity committee. And I was more interested in uh, finding real value that I can bring on the finance and audit committee, which, which I felt I did bring. But the energy that this committee in the last two and a half years has, has generated and the sincerity that I know all the people on this call our feeling from us and the respect and the humility has really driven and inspired me uh, to be honored to help uh, try to carry the mantle that the committee and Bob's leadership has started. And, it, and what really did that for me was a story Bob told us, which I'll just reiterate if he, I assume he won't mind, which was uh, 
couple of years ago, the New York City police chief um, announced or offered an apology for Stonewall. Now it was, a, I re vaguely remember hearing about it. It, as a, it didn't in directly impact me, but I watched as Bob told how much that apology, that recognition meant to him. Someone who wasn't at Stonewall, he and I were in California at that, at that time, but the impact that it meant to him really changed me to believe that uh, we have to fight we have to fight our own laziness and our own passivity and compliance and complacency to really make a difference. And with leadership of Jesse and Doug particularly, and this committee, uh, the, there's incredible work happening. So you and your orchestra, uh, find allies, go find some inspiration uh, and make some things happen. Uh, and, and we, you are not alone in the uh, person the violence in Virginia, if you feel alone, Call any of us, reach out to us. We are with you, okay? You are not alone. So at this point in time, I would like to, uh, David, we can share, because uh, people often like ending sessions with you know, some number of things to think about specifically. I think our colleagues have given us hundreds of things to think about, but I wanted to share one other panel slide with you as we uh, move to close and we can, can come back to this. So I think it's just helpful for us to, to note that the word diversity has, has been something that orchestras have talked about uh, for decades, since the 70s, 80s, and that has always meant you know, bringing uh, bodies into the setting. Uh, and, and to someone who asked, how do we avoid tokenism? Well, if you're only thinking of bringing difference into the setting, that is, that's diversity and that's great, but that it leaves itself open to tokenism. The equity aspect that we're looking at, as you can see, is fair access and opportunity, but it is also looking for a parity of outcome and experiences. So back to the board question. You, you want your board members to be as engaged as every one of my colleagues on this panel. You know, you want them to feel the same joy of giving. Alan Valentine mentioned that, that incoming board chair and, their, and her support for the orchestra and in excitement, you want everyone to feel that way. That goes beyond just having uh, whatever token number uh, diversity represented. That goes to wanting to connect with people. And then the sense of inclusions, where they not only are energized and have good outcomes, but they feel valued and they feel that they belong. So this committee and, and these terms are things that we feel deeply. And it's important to just understand how they're different because they're often in the world just looked at as a bunch of letters as, as opposed to what they really mean. And if we can just move to the last, uh, the next slide, if you don't mind, David, uh, this is the full list of the people who are on this amazing committee that I am, am privileged to serve with. And um, they're from around the country and the, as has already been mentioned, Partici mentioned just as well, this, the value of each of these people is, is, is incredible. Uh, and we thank them for that. Can I, uh, we go on to one last slide, um, and then I'm going to return back to any other questions and comments. But I just thought I'd share some things to think about as it relates to combating anti-Black racism. And, and obviously, these types of things can apply to all types of racism, all types of beliefs that others are either inferior or superior to you. Um, one is centering the people, centering on the people who are being harmed. So often, as I heard in one question, someone asked about, uh, let me put it this way, our questions can often come from a me-centric place. You know, how do I get what I want out of this situation? Rather than understanding, okay, how might this person feel? And if I understand how they feel, how do they want to feel? And you work toward that, things might be well. For example, audience development. Oh, how do we get more butts and seats? Well, why not ask what types of uh, entertainment do people enjoy? How would they like to spend an evening? <laughs> well, you know, how, how can we make our orchestral experience something that's exciting and, and undeniable to them? So in this case, it's about the harm. Um, the systematic discrimination has harmed people, not just long ago. There are lingering effects. The legacy of that is deeper than I can actually articulate in this moment. And the field needs to be perceived as a sensitive and responsive and 
to that as opposed to ignoring it and acting as if it doesn't exist. Um, there's, and, and the way to address it is to, as Alan Valentine said so well, talk to people, ask them their experience, how are they feeling and what, and that leads to, you know, learning the history of systematic discrimination. Um, and becoming over time through number one and two, aware of one's own behaviors and words and assumptions and processes uh, that are really gonna be, be helpful. And then uh, to stay open to new perspectives. I'll give you an example that DBR taught me, uh, Daniel taught me just a few days ago as we were preparing for this. Um, I, don't know if, uh, I wrote uh, something and I used the phrase African-American, people of color, black people. And he pointed out to me, which I so appreciate, that, well, you know, uh, those mean different things and to the different people. And I learned in that conversation or exchange, it was an email exchange, that I'm 50 years old. When I grew up, what was given to me was the term African American as an achievement. Because when my parents got it, we're now Americans who are from a place like the Irish Americans. Wow, African American. That's, that's, that's a great thing. However, my son uh, is of a generation where he's faster to acknowledge that he has no connection to Africa. Neither do I. I've never been to Africa. Never desired to go to Africa. I have no connection there. Um, that may be, that's obviously I'm missing out, but that's just how I feel. So I can understand why his generation connects more easily to black people, <laughs> the, that phrase. So in that moment, I was walking in my backyard complain, uh, thinking about this. I had to learn, I had to stay open. It's not that my parents were wrong or I was wrong or what have you, it's just times change. And so the ability to stay open and flexible and tolerant is really gonna help us, again, that word tolerant against bigotry. How do we avoid being intolerant? Stay tolerant, stay open, stay flexible. And then be an ally. Oh, I'm sorry, find your own way to stand up. For many of my friends, and including the violinists in Virginia and Richmond, it is out protesting. For me, the last week, it's been preparing for things like this and trying to help organizations conceptualize their way to be helpful in addressing equity, diversity, and inclusion work. Um, be an ally. Increase the number of allies. Don't just sit there with that board member who's obstinate and just say, well, there's nothing I can do about him or her. Try to understand them. Uh, engage with them. Uh, see, learn their perspective in ways that will, over time, develop empathy within them to want to understand your perspective. Embrace discomfort and uh, uh, develop a unwavering commitment to these goals. As a board member watching the chairman and the CEO of this organization demonstrate the, that point has been inspiring to me. And, and my own work uh, running an apartment or running a college, uh, I know what it feels like for people to watch the leader and ask, is she really committed to this? Is she gonna forget about this in two weeks? How important for her or him? So I, that's important for all of us to demonstrate that. And then finally, develop mechanisms that keep you accountable, uh, just like we want for our organizations uh, on, a day, on a regular basis. Those are some, just some thoughts, some ways, and I would love to hear from my colleagues on the panel. If there are any reactions to that, amplifications, um, please feel free to, to speak up. Um, I can't see whose hand's up, I'm sorry. Oh, Daniel, go ahead. Um, just really, <clears throat> first of all, a lot of a lot of love in the room, and don't be don't be afraid to ask the tough questions. We had we had Doug, you answered in the in the chat room to some really tough questions about representation, and I would say uh, maybe the um, the um, uh, the not the apparent and the not so apparent. That's a lesson for us all. I'm I'm learning all I I learned from you, Aaron. I learned from my young son who is half black, half white half Jewish, half Catholic. He um, schooled me to TikTok last night. And uh, we were setting up my account and he made sure to block me because, you know, you don't want that. But I did see his account and he had a black fist up there as his picture. I, and I, I recognized, him. I said, Zachary, what is that? He said, oh, that's BLM. I said, what's that? That's Black Lives Matters. I said, 
well, what does that mean to you? And without skipping a beat, he said, well, I think, I think dad, you know, look, all lives matter, but black lives sometimes don't. He's 10 years old, 10 years old. So I, I, I want to say that, um, sorry, I want to, I don't know about anybody, you know, we still have over 400, well over 400 people on the line. I'm always on the precipice of tears. I think about, think about your own life at 10 years old. Think about the first time you heard an orchestra play. Think about that precious relationship you had when the only thing that mattered was seeing what was for you, your community up on that stage doing something magical. Forget about who you are. Think about who you were. Think about the broad, inclusive nature of a child's imagination. Think about what they're going through right now. Can you imagine? One crisis on top of another. Think about who they look to. Think about the voices they're not hearing. So it makes all of our work so much easier when we just imagine, when we just aspire and inspire. And I'm learning all the time too, Aaron. You know, I'm learning all the time from you, from everyone on this board. I think about Jesse. I think about Patricia. I think about Mary, you know, who, by the way, you know, look at, I don't know how your views are set up, but let me leave with this. Mary and I couldn't obviously be more different, right? As I like to say, the differences are obvious. What are the things that we share in common? That's where the art lies. And like Aaron, I enter sometimes an organization or a conversation with deep suspicion. That suspicion is informed by my gender, by my race, by my experience. Am I a victim of privilege? Probably. And I would like to leave, and I'm going to go back to the chat room, but I want to leave and lead with this. If we can not fall, if we can be aware that in the coming days and weeks, we're all going to fall victim to amnesia, right? We're all going to forget. That's what happens. That's the American way. We are not going to be able to hold on to the feelings of change and value that are embedded in us in this moment. So whatever you need to do to your, for yourself, write it down, take a picture, make a video of yourself, post it somewhere online so that when you start, when the battle becomes hard, when you want to start to retreat, when the invitations are happening, when your imagination muscle starts to get a little um, coarse and atrophy sets in. I'm going to remember Mary. I came into the office. I didn't know anybody really. I was looking around. I felt very insecure. And this woman, come here, <laughs> sit down next to me. I was, I, you know, I, I, I'm leaving you with, as an artist in this moment, because I just want us to remember that, you know, the League of American Orchestras is truly a place where risk, purpose, and love happens every day. And I'm very proud to be one very small part of a very big idea that Mary introduced me to and all of you are going to keep going through with love. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's so many incredible questions and experiences being shared on the line that I'm frustrated in, in my greediness that we won't be able to get to all of them in the same, with the same weight and, and concern that we would love to. Um, as we move to prepare to close, I did want to try to address one of these uh, threads, which has to do with, I'll call it consequences. Someone asked, you know, what's the league's guidance? And as some organizations are putting up statements and beginning to hear from a small, I'm sure, but a not unimportant number of constituents who are, uh, you know, threatening to withdraw their support or uh, pulling back and uh, reacting. I guess one of the, the things I did not put in that little list of eight that you know, we're re revising is, uh, that I took out is, is an important thing to remember. As you start to do this type of work, uh, gratitude will be in small supply. 
It'll be in small supply from the people who like the status quo. It'll be, except for after some time, like uh, we just saw from DBBR, it'll, it'll be in small supply from the people who are the bruised ones, who you're trying to help. Because it's going to take, you know, they've been beat up. So they actually believe your sincerity will take some time. So you have to be so committed to this work that that rich donor who maybe gave, you know, 30% of your annual giving, who's now threatening, what am I going to do if I lose, lose him or her? You have to be committed to be creative in that and realize the 570 some people who were on this call uh, believe in you and support you. Maybe you just need to activate other people. You know, I, I'm reminded of uh, Jackie Robinson. And uh, we all, as Americans, I'm sure, are aware of, of his relationship with Branch Rickey, who spoke of as, you know, the Brooklyn Dodgers and hired him and brought him onto the field. But no one ever talks about Kennesaw Landis. Kennesaw Landis was the baseball commissioner from 1920 until 1944 a judge, very well respected judge who helped the league after the scandal in 1918. And he was a staunch, bigoted racist. And although in public pronouncements, he would say, oh, anybody can come try out for our league. He made sure all of the owners stayed in line and never hired, as he said, a nigger. And it was only because he died in 1944 and a new commissioner came in who was open-minded. Branch Rickey found his moment and said, we're gonna be bringing in this guy to Montreal in 1940, 46, to be in our minor leagues. And then 1947, signed him April 15th. So we all talk about Branch Rickey, but no one remembers that there was an obstacle in, that, in their way. And until that obstacle was knocked down or left, you know, they had to wait. Bob Wagner, in my mind, has carried this load while I was too impatient as a Blue League board member. He carried it, he carried it, and then amalgamation of things, Jesse, same, patient, and then all of a sudden, the environment was right two years ago when we started all the work that Doug is talking about that will become to flourishing. The statement that we made, that the League made, the, I, I don't want to speak for Jesse, but he didn't have to sweat about that. He had, a, he had a, a legion of people helping him pull that together in a way that is sincere to this organization. And to the person who's worried about, well, what are we going to do? People are upset at us. The real question is, is your organization aligned? Does the staff and the board commit to the statement you put out? Of the majority, at least. If so, buck up. You know, why do you expect it to be an easy ride? It's not supposed to be easy. A hundred years of segregation, is the, you know, 400 years of enslavement. This stuff is not simple. It doesn't just go away. So we have to be very committed and we have to be creative. You have to find a new donor. Unless you're going to do what baseball did and just wait until Lanzas died. It's a choice. So I don't mean to end on a, a, a negative note. I actually do want us to pull up the slides so that we can all see and celebrate the musicians that we saw at the top of the session and, and acknowledge the orchestras they come from. Again, they're just a sampling of the, the many wonderful artists who are in our field today who can be resources to you in terms of how do I find musicians in my area? I don't know where to find them. Um, there are a lot of people in the world. This is not everybody who's out here, but it's a sampling and, and these colleagues of ours uh, care deeply. Uh, and I'm sure several of them are on this call. So um, I would be remiss without first thanking uh, Jesse and Doug for prioritizing this time to change things around on no notice and make this happen um, for, for my panel colleagues on the Equity, Diversity, Inclusion Committee to change their schedules to be here on no notice because they care. And most importantly, for the hundreds of you who have joined us in this time to listen and to engage and be together. We are a family dealing with a family problem. But I am so encouraged at the end of this call and session more than even at the beginning, because I know you're all there with us. 
Um, I will want to turn things back over to Jesse. I know there may be some other house cleaning issues, but on behalf of, of all of us, thank you so much for the, your time and the work you're going to put in to fight anti-Black racism. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I can't thank you enough. I love you. It was fantastic. And, uh, and I want to thank all the members of our, our EDI committee and the, and the league board. And, and while we are humble, um, I am also grateful to all of you for being the wonderful board that you are. Um, just a couple of things that you know, one can't help underscoring. One is that the participation and the questions certainly signal to me we have to have lots more conversations like this. There are a lot of questions to answer and a lot of big issues. And that this was such a constant and robust engagement is, is wonderfully heartening. And the league is, is this is what we do. We, we make meetings. So we'll, we will make more opportunities to dig into these questions. I also want to um, just point out again that uh, Aaron has curated and uh, with, with the help of this committee and even Julia yesterday, kind of a catalog of emotions, of being beat up, of being traumatized, being eviscerated, being frustrated, being exhausted. And the, these are the feelings, these are the experiences. And Aaron's first point on that next to last slide was to center the people who were being harmed. And I think that is a, a powerful, and appropriate and strong message. And I'd like us to close with that idea in mind. And uh, lastly, just to ask everyone to please go to the uh, little evaluation down at the bottoms of your screen. And we'll see you again tomorrow. Thanks so much for being with us this afternoon. Bye-bye.